So if anyone has uh, uh, you know, no particular knowledge of C++, that's okay, because the uh, uh, part of the talk is very specific to C++, but part of it can be uh, applied to pretty much any other um, um, programming language. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit of uh, uh, what this talk is about. Uh, we're going to see that there are some things that are called BSL polymorphic allocators and how they're useful uh, for uh, programming uh, in C++. Uh, we're going to see that there is another thing that we call the BSLS assert facility and, and how that also will uh, improve the quality and, and, and the cor correctness of your programs. Uh, we're going to see that that's not all there is and, and then there will be time for questions. Uh, this is a classic quote before starting the presentation. Uh, um, I stumbled into this one and I thought that it sums up pretty well uh, one of the driving principles that we apply in developing uh, uh, BSL. Um, so moving on, uh, what is BSL? BSL Bloomberg Standard Library is a C++ open source software library that has been developed at Bloomberg LP. It's a very fundamental, very low level software library that provides uh, uh, many tools that we will see in the course of this talk uh, that are aimed to enable the uh, software writer, in particular library writers, software library writers, to write software that is more flexible and that is more correct and that is more uh, uh, performing. All right, so I'd like to start with a very simple example, uh, something that in various forms, in different shapes, but that I'm sure people encounter all the time. We have a set of strings. Let's say we have you know, 100,000 strings, right? And we have to populate a vector that is a, a, a container, an organized container, a managed container, with these strings. Because we're then still going to use them later on in our program. Or we, because you know, our input form, for example, a char star uh, uh, type is not, is not you know, the kind of type you want to deal with in your program. Who knows? Um, um, so what we have, what we have here is you know, 100,000 strings. They're char star type, so it's an array of char star uh, C strings, and then we create a vector, right? An empty vector, V, and then very simply we start populating it uh, with this 100,000 um, strings. Now there are more elegant ways to do this through the standard uh, library algorithms, uh, but for the simplicity of this presentation I, I thought that this was more readable um, to, to, uh, to, for people. So, what, what can be slow with this? Suppose that we need to make this as fast as we can and, and, and we want to keep this, this form in which we're filling a vector so we're not considering other data structures that might be more, uh, more ad hoc for this purpose. Uh, what, what could we do? Any, any idea of what could we do to make it better? Well, no, reserve that vector. Reserve reserve reserve. Great, great, perfect. Very good, very good. That's one of the problems, right? So as we insert strings in the vector, the vector has, has to grow its capacity, which is the area of memory that it allocates to contain all the various objects that are inserted. And as, as it grows, it doubles its capacity in the most of the implementations of vector. Um, and so these this allocations for space are, are, are some, um, somewhat um, you know, cumbersome. They, 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 uh, they take time. So that's one thing. If we look at the code, there is another thing that I don't know if you noticed. There is a little inefficiency. So I'm passing a char star into the pushback for the vector. So now that is, that, um, it is converted automatically into a standard string. So there is a standard string that gets automatically constructed just for the sake of being passed into the vector. Now maybe the compiler will optimize this, maybe it will not, we don't know. So we have possible inefficiency because of this extra copy, but, and we'll see what also this extra copy entails. And we have another inefficiency, and the inefficiency is that every time I insert a string, I am going to copy the string inside the vector, right? Um, because that, that's the nature of it. And, and why is that slow? So there are these problems. Uh, anyone want to take a guess? So what is going to be a part of the you know, computational cost of this operation? Well, I'm moving up and down the stack, copying stuff. Um, well, the stack actually is not going to move much. No, 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 but I mean, uh, every time I have to construct a string, as you said, I have to copy memory to allocate, to do a new. Yes. And that's expensive. Yes, exactly. So, so this is exactly one of the problems. Every time we create a new string, 
depending on the implementation and the length of the string, well, this is going to, this, is, this might allocate new memory. And whenever we copy the string into the vector, this copy might allocate new memory. So there are certain operations here that if we preserve the schema, are, are, it's not possible to optimize more than a certain amount. But, but the memory allocation is one of those things that can weigh a lot and that we can optimize. Um, as you say, we could have improved by uh, doing a reserve, but this would have just solved one problem, and probably a number of allocations that is very uh, low compared to the number of allocations you have for allocating 100,000 streams. Um, so, I want to go over another example. Uh, we have a man. Imagine you have a, a, a simple application in the financial world, right, in which you have people buying stocks and people selling stocks, and now you want to keep a tra you want to keep track of what is the price that people have to pay to buy a certain stock. So you say, well, that's easy. I'm going to put it into a map, and I'm going to say, you know, the first um, um, well, there is a bug in the, in the slides that should be a chart star. Um, there is a string in the map, and and the value that is the best price for for that stock. Great. Now the problem is that um, when somebody puts that order to sell a certain amount of stocks, well, we'll insert that certain price for that stock. But at some point, that, that the order might be filled and the liquidity might not be available anymore, so the order must be removed, or the person can cancel the order. And so we should remove it. And now, these operations in a financial system can happen at a very, very impressive frequency. And so now here we have a problem. How do we make this as fast as possible again? Right? So, once again, what, what can be very cost efficient? Now, look that I didn't, I selected char star on purpose this time, just so we don't have to talk about strings. So, what is one of the things that can be, that can weigh on the operational cost of doing insert and remove very often? Mm, well, I, I made my free software a bit because every time I make a stupid file, so I get right. free behind the map. True. So um, standard map implementations that are um, good implementation, that's a very good point. The tree must be balanced. While standard map implementations that are uh, solid implementation usually use red-black trees or ABG trees, ADL trees, I mean, and so um, they usually are balanced. So let's say that balance is not a problem. Hey, I mean, it's still the new one. Uh, it's still the, it's the comparison, but the comparison doesn't match because they were log comparisons that have been fine. So that's not the thing. Right. Creating the creating the data once again. Right, very good. So the comparison indeed could be even optimized by using maybe integers, as we have yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. um, um, So really the cost here is the logarithmic cost every time to look for something or inserting it, as we know, you know inserting in a balanced tree is always a all of log land um, uh, time complexity, uh, worst case scenario. So um, really the cost, as it's saying, it is to allocate the nodes, because the nodes that are inside of the tree do not, do not exist before insertion and have to cease to exist after the, the deletion. And so this, these nodes are dynamically allocated you know, because the growth could, could the, the, the tree could grow arbitrarily, and so we don't want to run over the you know, amount of space that we have in the stack, right? So the, tro the, 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 the tree allocates for every node. So every time we insert a node, it allocates a node. A node that has two pointers, right, you know, left and right, and has a value and possibly has a back pointer to the parent who knows what the implementation is, and then it removes it, and look at it, removes it. This is a lot of allocations that you have just for inserting and removing, where the values do not allocate anything. This is just some primitive types. You just man copy them, basically. Where it's four bytes, eight bytes, it's just man copy. So yes, allocation is a problem. And it turns out that, that general focus allocators aren't that great, usually. For they're not optimized for every scenario, I shouldn't say they're great. They aren't optimized for every scenario, and that means that you might run into circumstances in which um, the general scheme of allocation might not provide optimal performances. Um, and as we see, in the, in the example of the vector, we wanted to allocate memory in, in a certain way. In the case of the, of the tree, we want to allocate memory, we, we have different memory. For example, in the case of the tree, we always allocate the same thing, which is, um, which is a, a node. And a node has a fixed size because the value inside the node is fixed. It's an int and a double, and we know that. Um, or a char star, um, a char star, yes, a pointer and a double. 
Um, but in the case of, of the strings in the vector, for example, we don't know how big the strings are. We don't know how much of this we have to allocate. And so, so there are different strategies. And of course, a, a, a general purpose allocator can only offer you know, one strategy that has to work for everything. And as we, as we were discussing, and, and it's easy to imagine, um, uh, allocations are uh, bottleneck in high performance environments like financial applications, or even, for example, 3D uh, graphics and video games. And as I can imagine, uh, robotics in planning and maps, uh, uh, maps development and, 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 and reasoning and this kind of, and this kind of operations. Um, so uh, there are other concerns that, that memory allocation in general brings up in the software development, and they're particularly true in embedded devices, um, such as uh, robots, for example. Um, one is the fragmentation. So all this process of allocating memory, the allocating memory that is taken from you know, a big chunk of memory that is available to the system might you know, bring to the, the system to a point in which there is enough uh, memory to satisfy your request, but it's not contiguous. And so the, 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 the request can be satisfied. Um, there is also a problem of availability, because in, in embedded system, you might have uh, a very short, uh, a very limited amount of memory. And so what happens you know, if I try to allocate the number of some memory that I don't have? That, that's a problem, right? I rely on the fact that I have it, and I don't have it. Um, the standard allocator, uh, or, and actually all allocators that are standard compatible, have to throw an allocation if they run out of memory. Now, what happens to a robot if there is an allocation thrown in and, and it's not caught? I don't know. I think it's we. I think nobody really knows. I mean, you know, you might just lose ten thousand dollars of equipment like that, and it's not nice. And and obviously there is a, a, a programming uh, a challenge here, right? You have to deal with the lifetime management of the object. Whenever every time you uh, allocate an object, you have to re remember to remove it, right? Delete it, and we all know that this is sometimes source of bugs. And, and problems. So there are some problems. Um, the standard, uh, the standard committee decided that the STL, which is a standard template libraries, which is the same thing as generics in Java, this collection of containers and, and, and algorithms to use as containers, proposed something. Okay, very easy. We decided that you can use something called an allocator type, and this allocator type is uh, somehow uh, uh, usable with our standard containers and that will allow you to specify how you want your allocator to behave so that you can optimize for a certain scenario. But, um, and this is how you do it. Uh, you have a standard uh, container like vector, you specify the type, and as a second parameter, template parameter, you specify the type of the allocator that you must have defined somewhere else. Um, we'll see what are the implications of this. Um, this is what a standard allocator looks like. The standard says, okay, you have to have a bunch of you know, type desks. That, you know, some of them are more or less clear. Uh, then you have to have a bunch of methods that you know, I'm, I'm not sure what they really do. Uh, but these are these are the four methods that are uh, you know most uh, that are the most interesting ones, right? Uh, allocate, the allocate, construct, and destroy. So allocate and the allocate is really where you specify the new behavior that you want to have when the memory is allocated, and the allocate, you know, obviously is. Um, uh, the behavior that you have to do to re re release this memory, that you have to implement to release this memory. Construct and destroy, it's interesting that they're there because these are invoked, those are the, the, the functions that should invoke the, 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 the construction, the, the, the default constructor or the constructors for uh, the objects that are built into the memory uh, that is being allocated. So, so there are some, you know, there are some methods and, and, and and there are, this is what it looks like. It's, it's just, you know, to give you an idea of what it means to implement, you know, a standard allocator. Okay, well, so let's use them. Great, now we have our problems. We, we know how to solve them. We can create an allocator A1, an allocator A2. Allocator A1, maybe, I don't know, we'll take all that will be a buffered allocator, we'll put some buffer of memory on the stack, and then we'll use that memory to allocate the strings that it will be allocated in. And allocator two, maybe I will be, who knows, uh, another allocator that does another thing. Uh, it can be a pooled allocator that has a pool of objects that are pre-allocated, or who knows. Well, we decided we want to have B1 and B2 with two different allocators. Great, now we try to do this. And it doesn't work. Then we try to do this. Uh, um, unfortunately, the, the projector is a little colorblind but where I am, but that's a red. <laughs> B1 equals B2 should be red. Um, so, uh, comparison, doesn't work, right again. 
swap, you can swap the vector. Now there's a famous idiom in which when you want to you trim the size of the vector, you the full construct a new one and then you swap, right? Uh, copy construct another one and then cut and copy. No, can't do that. It was even worse. Now I have, you know, a function that takes a standard vector that holds objects for type T. Great! Now I have my optimized vector with allocator A2 that does all the magic for allocation. Well, I can't pass it in the function. So now, using the standard allocator seems really cool, but it's really not that simple or that flexible. And there are other problems in general memory allocation. You know, a generic memory allocator, maybe, or most likely, is thread safe. So there might be contention, and there might be, you might be paying the price of you know, synchronization when you don't need it. Because maybe you're, you know that in that specific piece of code, there is no contention. Um, also, as you see, we are adding template parameters. I don't know if any of you is familiar with how the compiler deals with uh, template parameter instantiations. But for each combination of the template parameter that you specify, and for each function that is template, parameterized on, on this template parameters, the compiler will generate a different symbol. So here, you go, you go uh, uh, um, facing a lot of different symbols, which include, which will increase the size of your code, of your objective code, of the object code that is built by the compiler. And that code has to be loaded in memory. That code runs slower for this reason. It takes longer to compile. There are a lot of you know um, things that, that are not nice. Well, so two very smart people uh, that, that uh, work for Bloomberg LP. Uh, one is John Lakers, and the other person is uh, Pablo Halper. Thought about this problem a lot, and they uh, started providing some thoughts uh, that were proposed to the standard uh, committee in the, in the late nineties. And and these thoughts were, well, what about what if we have a polymorphic allocator model, and we'll see what that is. BSL, the Bloomberg Standard Library, um, rotates around this concept of the polymorphic uh, allocator. Um, a polymorphic allocator, very, very intuitively, is, a, is an allocator that is part of a hierarchy of, of classes, that, hence polymorphism. Mm -hmm. um, all polymorphic allocators derive from this class called BSLMA allocator, which is a pure abstract class. It cannot be instantiated, it just works as an interface in Java. And we call these things in the BSL uh, world. We call them protocols, uh, a term that is overloaded in many in many different contexts. But so every allocator must derive from this. And every type in BSL, and every type that you develop via BSL, uh, will take in its constructors as last parameter an optional pointer to a BSL and allocator. So that means that in your, in, your, in your signature of your constructors, you can or cannot specify a BSLMA allocator. And at this point, you don't have to write your signature in terms of the specific type of the allocator that you want to use. You just put in a generic BSLMA allocator. Then, uh, you know, when you write your program, you'll be able to supply any of the concrete instances of this, of this protocol. So this starts to feel very flexible, right? We have a type that is generic. And, and I can decide at any time, any point in time, to pass any specific, any concrete implementation of this pure abstract class. Um, and, and, and this is this is really good. But there is another thing. As we do so, the object, the, the allocator, becomes a property of the state and not anymore of the type. So every type will have the same allocator template parameter. Really. Any 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 standard container will be templatized in the same allocator template parameter, which is an allocator that somehow has inside the BSLMA allocator. And so I can do a lot of things now. I can decide that each object in my flow has a different allocator. And this is great. Imagine you want to put in test allocators. Now we can put a different test allocator for each different object. So you can track the flow of allocation and the allocations of each object with named allocators, the printout, and you can go and query and say, hey, did this allocator do that? Did this allocator do that? And, and, and um, the library offers a lot of very interesting things. For example, it offers mechanisms to say, well, from now on, until the end of this code, I want the default allocator to be something else. Great. Now you know you can scope the allocator into a function, for example, and say that that function will use as an allocator a pulled allocator name. Or, or, or a buffer 
buffer level here that have the properties of, of being extremely, extremely fast. Um, is, this, is this making sense? Are there, are there questions? I didn't stop before and ask if there was any doubt or something that... No? Sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> As we will see, this will, will allow us to do a lot of good things. Because now imagine I have these two allocators, right? My allocator one, my allocator two, they both inherit from the SLMA allocator that, as we saw before, is the class that you had to marry from. Now I can create a BSL vector, Bloom or something like a vector, and a BSL vector again of integers. Uh, and I can pass the allocator to the runtime parameter. See, there is no template parameter right there, and it's gone. The question is maybe another one. So let's say I have two objects with the same allocator, which share the same instance of allocator. Uh, do the allocator should know about the object? No. Or not? No. Okay, yeah. yeah. So Absolutely there's no, yeah. no back reference and then right. it can work. Absolutely. Yeah. The allocator only supplies memory when asked to do so. And yeah. it doesn't know yeah. any, anything about who is asking that question. Okay. You could, and I wouldn't advise so, but you could write up an allocator that has knowledge of other things, but I, I would think that that is, that is not. Sick. Probably given the advantages that you might think. So as you see, we have B1, B2, as before. They have two different allocators, meaning that one is a buffered allocator, one is a pooled allocator, one is a shared memory allocator. You can, you know, you name it. Great. Now, let's see, I try to do this, and it works. I try to compare, and it works. I try to swap, and it works. I try to pass it into a function uh, that has been truncated by the slide, and, and guess what happens? Does it work? Yeah? yeah? Everybody work? Yes, it will work. It will work because at this point, the type is not parameterized anymore on different allocators. It, it, it really is instantiated with the same uh, allocator. So, let's review. If I didn't make it clear, these things you cannot do with a standard allocator, but you can do with a BSL allocator. And this is a, a big win in terms of you know, flexibility reusability of software and 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 modularity. Um, these are some examples of what allocators you can have. You can have a buffer sequential allocator. I get a slab of memory from the stack very fast. It's just an increase of this, you know, uh, actually maybe not even that. It's just to say, you know, there is a, this amount of memory on the stack, and then you can basically have a pointer inside that buffer of memory, and every time you request memory, the allocator gives it to you and moves the pointer the pointer forward. You see, you move the point forward, and when you're done, you're done. Or when you're done, it allocates from the default allocator. So we can speed up, for example, you know, certain amount of operations, and then we're done. This is very useful for throwaway things, right? I have a vector, I have to populate it in a throwaway domain. Why do I have to allocate all this stuff? I know probably lots of size of the vector already. I create a buffer that is as big as the size of the vector. Fill it in, throw it away. Very fast. Arena allocators. Maybe I have a pool of memory that I put on, on maybe a file, who knows, that I put on, I mapped onto some, who knows what, and I just want to allocate from that pool of memory. There you go, that's how you do it. And, and pool allocators, as we've seen in the case of node based containers, for example, this is very useful. You have objects that always have the same size, they have to be allocated and be allocated often. Well, you have a pool, you pull them, and you reuse you, them. These are two papers that um, can tell you more about, about uh, allocators and why you know, the allocator model of the standard right now is not as good as it should be. And uh, they have a lot of interesting charts too that you can look at. Uh, so the first one was authored by uh, Pablo Harper and John Lucas. The second was uh, from the University of Massachusetts. And uh, I think that these are interesting reads if uh, uh, so you wish. Um, so, are, are there questions so far? Okay, did I, did I bore you already? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, uh, so like, first of all, I really like this idea. Uh, I mean, I think it might work very well. You don't have to use it always. Yeah. Of course, the concept of the scope allocator yeah. is I have a piece of code, I profile it, I find out that there are some parts of it that are really you know, uh, held back by performance due to our memory allocation, then I can go into these parts. I can put on the stack, maybe a buffer sequential allocator, pass it in, and boom. And remember, you can't do that in a normal C++ program because at that point, all your types will be 
you know, changed, and then your compiler will not compile anymore. And the effort of optimizing a small piece of code will become from you know a couple of hours of work to maybe days or months, depending on the size of the code. So this is something to keep in mind. And that and that's a very good point. You don't have to always pass in an allocator. That's why it's an optional parameter. If you don't pass it in, you get what it is the default. The added bonus here is that you get to say what the default is too. So you know you really have, you can have it all or not, but you have the flexibility to dial it a little bit, more or less, as, as you do. So yeah, that's a very good point. Um, before we proceed, I, I want to introduce very quickly uh, some um, uh, conventions in the library. Okay, the library is has a, a unit of physical design and logical design uh, that is called the component. And a component is a pair of H and dot h and dot cpp files that are together with an associated test driver that will unit test each of the functions and each of the publicly exported uh, uh, symbols that are in the in the in the cpp file. Uh, there are a lot of rules on what makes a component, especially for what concerns what can be publicly exported. Everything publicly exported should be defined in the header file. The header file is always the first substantive line of the cpp files. There are a lot of rules for non ASIC. You can have, have cycles between um, between components, so you cannot include, you know, uh, cyclically header files. Um, they are all described on the wiki page on GitHub. Their physical code organization. You can see more about that. Uh, components are grouped into packages. Packages are uh, are grouped into package groups that eventually are the unit of release, so the libraries. So, so this is basically the physical design that is at the base of the library, and in the the code inside the CPP files is always in the namespace of the package, never of the package group. The name of the package group is always the first two letters of the package. So we save some, uh, a couple of columns uh, you know, from, from, from typing that. Um, OK, well, that, that was just to explain a little better what we'll see there. Uh, there is a section on coding standards. It's almost a manual. These are the coding standards that we enforce at Blueberry.de. They're awesome, and they, they, they have a lot of um, they have a lot of good. Uh, so change of pace a little bit. Uh, I bet a lot of people have seen this sooner or later in their life. Uh, very simple function. Give me the nth Fibonacci number. Uh, Fibonacci numbers are that is the sequence of numbers in which each number is the sum of the two previous numbers in the sequence, except for number one and number zero which depending on which definition uh, you look at, sometimes they're uh, associated with zero uh, and one, or sometimes we're, we're both are supposed to be one, which was one just for the simplicity of, uh, uh, of the stomach. Um, does anyone see any problem in this code? You mean why it's both? No. Well, in the, the, the number, big, the Fibonacci number might be big. Okay, yeah, there are some problems in that. Definitely this code you know, will blow up. There could be a um, uh, overflow because they, they grow very, very quickly. What do you mean a problem? Uh, uh, what do you mean? you should have a parameter and avoid double recursion, right? Of course. That is very true. Double recursion is very slow. And it could be made a linear tail recursion, for sure. Uh, it could be even, there is also an algorithm that, uh, that, that can be done in an iterative way. Uh, we just want to ask there are some uh, roots, square root to call it the color for That's not the point. No, no, but, but, but you're right. It could be optimized uh, on the reverse. Oh, yeah. But yes, this is not all what's, what's wrong. But that is wrong. Do you guys see something that can really... Make it faster or... I mean, no, make, make your problem correct. Okay, let's, um, let's look at this line. Ah. <laughs> now what happens? Okay, okay. Hmm. We don't know. Yeah. But I have another question for you. What should happen? Well, I mean, you have infinity recursion in this case. No, 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 no. Okay. But this is because that's our code. But what do you, if I just give you this function and you well, don't see the implementation. You to the beginning that you want the number to be positive. You have to see it from the beginning. That's very true. That's very true. You have to, you have to count on agreement with somebody. And uh, there is a name for that usually. And this name is preconditions. So yes, what we really want to know is what are the preconditions and what are the postconditions of this thing. We gave it for granted, and maybe in the case of Fibonacci, it's also very intuitive and easy. But when you're facing a piece of software you've never seen, 
Well, you got to know what preconditions and plus conditions are, or how are you sure that you're interacting correctly with that software? Uh, how do we know which to zero, right? How, how, how would you know? He said it has to be positive. How did you know that? Because the Fibonacci function uh, is defined uh, from this number. Because what, sorry? Because the, function, the Fibonacci function uh -huh. is defined for positive numbers. Okay, let's say I call it Fibonacci Stefan. Okay, so my Fibonacci. It's another Fibonacci. I'm trying, you know, I think that guy is overrated. So I'm going to do my, my own Fibonacci. And I'm actually going to return zero for now for negative numbers. Now, now, is that okay? The point is that there are inputs uh, that are allowed by the compiler for which there right. is this, the output is not specified by the compiler. Right, exactly. But the question is who specified it? And yeah. how do I know? The developer should the developer. provide some documentation. Yes, the answer is documentation, exactly. There is no other way. I mean, you you could say, yeah, well, everybody knows what right? But yes, it's very, very good. There is no, there is no other way. Uh, contracts, that's what we really want. Designed by contract. Every function should have a contract. And the contract should say what the preconditions of the function are. The, of the function. So that I know when I invoke that function, I can verify that I'm invoking that function legally. But so now the question, well, the contracts tell us a lot more things, right? Tell us what the function does, what's the essential behavior, what are other things we never thought about. So there is a lot of goodness in writing extensive documentation. But post condition, essential behavior, and precondition, undefined behavior is really important. Well, this is what a contract looks like in, in BSF and the software we write. It's a long thing. This is for from uh, the allocator. From the SLMA allocator, the function allocate. This is what it does. It returns a newly allocated block of memory of at least a specified positive size and bytes. If size is zero, no function is returned with no other effect. If this allocator cannot return the requested number of bytes, then it will throw a standard bed allocate, bed allocation exception. In exception enabled builds. Or will abort the, step, the program in known exception builds. The behavior is undefined unless zero is less or equal than size. You specify a negative size and you're able to do that. Then the behavior is undefined. Oh, size type. Size type? Yeah. Well, most likely it has to be a, a, a unsigned type. So what happens when you put in you know, a negative number? Well, who knows? But the key here is the undefined behavior. See, the precondition is an undefined behavior. And let's see why we want that, right? What should a function do when you look at a function? So I text minus one. What should that? Asper. You bomb. Sorry? You bomb with an asper. You bomb. Yeah. We can bomb in many different ways. Right. Right. I mean, what I do in my code, if I write an asper, like you must so you abort it. And in, and in, in quotes. Very good. You write a string while you bomb. Very good. You assert that's that's a viable thing. Does anybody want to do anything else? Well, I could do nothing. Does anyone think that that's a good idea? Depending on the time you have. Doing nothing is evil, right? Doing nothing is evil. If the program, you know, if you do nothing, you, you have to program in a state that it's illegal. You don't know what's going to happen next. Probably the program, if it's in the state, should not continue, right? Should not continue normally because it's really an, an exception <coughs> state, right? Okay, so you know, doing nothing probably not a good idea. Uh, do we print it? To the standard output. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it's almost as good as doing nothing. Uh, let's just put it in a tiny bag. Maybe it's better to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe yes. Maybe it's better to say, I didn't know. <laughs> we could throw an exception. Well, maybe so, but what happens if I'm building my software without exceptions? What if I'm in, in, a, in a programming language? This, this argument, actually, this, this topic is applicable to any programming language, right? What if my programming language doesn't handle? Uh, uh, you know, exceptions. That's possible. So, throwing an exception is, is a possibility and and it's a valuable thing to do, but it's not necessarily the best answer. Well, how about work? Well, same thing. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe not. Maybe I don't want to work my program because it's going to cost thousands of dollars to other people because there is a sub portion of the program that is still continuing you know, to run and then will run fine. We don't know. 
Another thing, we could, for example, put our uh, a spin in, 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 the, in, we could basically spin and wait for somebody to touch the debugger. That's also uh, another thing that could be done. That, you know, some production system, systems, this might be a, a good idea. Well, one thing I hope you agree on is that something should be done and the, pro the, 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 the programmer should be made aware that something went wrong. And it's not error handling. Because as the professor correctly said, there is a number of inputs that the compiler allows. Among this number, in the set of inputs, there is a subset that is illegal, but there is another subset that is legal, but might still result in an error in the procedure. So it's an error that you account for, it's an error that you document, that you explain how it's handled, and you explain why it's legal, why it makes sense. So it's very it's different than that. And the answer to the question before. What should we do? It's really well, it's hard to say. Some people might want to do one thing, some people might want to do another thing. So my answer is that when you define your contract, you should say that it's undefined. And if you say that it's undefined behavior, at that point you can do anything. You can throw, you can you can assert, uh, you can uh, I don't know, spin, you can uh, print the standard output, or you can just you know fall, uh, send a phone call to somebody, who knows? Um, but the important thing is also, sometimes it's not possible to detect a violation of the preconditions. Or it's not computationally feasible. What if, for example, you know, I want to solve three sets, right? Well, that counts, you know, a little slow, maybe, depending on, on the size of the instance. Well, this is what BSL offers. Um, a facility for assertion that can be um, configured to have a behavior that you decide. And this behavior is decided by the owner of main, by the owner of the process. So the owner of main can decide to use your library, your software, and, and when a, 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 a out of contract you know, invocation is, is detected, abort, great, maybe I'm fine with that. Maybe the, the owner of main wants, to, uh, 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 wants an exception thrown and wants to be able to detect it and act accordingly. So, the SLS assert is, an, is a mapper and, and it represents a facility that is available to do so. Uh, the, it uses what we call the assert handler, and the assert handler is basically a function that can be installed at, at, at some point in the program uh, as the standard handler for assertions. So, basically, in your code, you can always use the SLS assert as you would use a normal assert and have the behavior determined by the handler uh, invoked when the, the, the assert fires. So this is powerful, but see, the default handler is abort. Okay, great, we're going to assert, like normal C assert rule. But uh, in reality, there are also two other off-the-shelf ready for you. Throw, it throws an exception, it's documented the exception that is. Or it sleeps, so that you can go in with your debugger and say, okay, now this is spinning because of this. Maybe you have you know, runtime uh, signals that you can send to your program to uh, get out of the, that, that situation, who knows? Uh, well, uh, if you are not accustomed to test your software, which is something that you should not do, you should test your software. Uh, using the SLS search for asserting on precondition violations will automatically increase SOC to a certain level the quality of your code anyway. So you don't even have to add, to add extra tests, which I strongly insist you should. But if you don't, even just plugging this in will give some level of confidence that you're doing the right thing. Some level, very some. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, but it, it, it kind of uh, goes around. Um, so before we go on, I just want to spend a couple of words more. Yes, I just heard say, that there are also different level of assertions. Uh, assertions that run, that, that fire in optimized mode, assertions that fire in normal mode, assertions that fire in debug mode, and you can decide which one you want to use depending on how much time you want to spend in terms of computation, checking for the preconditions compared to what the algorithm does. Because if your algorithm is very, if your piece of code is really, is really short and fast, and you put a big check on top of it, it's going to kill it, so it might not be worth it. But maybe there are modes, build modes, in which you might want to see if, that's, if that precondition was violated or not. 
And so, for example, in Gigabyte mode, in Gigabyte mode you can have uh, checks that are more expensive. And so you can use the BSLS cert safe that is that you can that is that is triggered when you build in safe mode. Let, let, let me understand like uh, so to you so BSLS cert is a macro that expands to the function name. Um, the function name is the is the, the, the function. It, it's the a function little bit more it's a little bit more complicated than that. And the code uh, I don't think we have the time now to get into that uh, in how it is actually written, but the code is online. On GitHub, and uh, we'll give the reference later. So you free, you know, now you're free to go there and explore it and, and make comments and suggestions. But the point I want to make is that this facility allows you to enable checks or disable them depending on which mode you build. And there are macros that you can pass into the compiler to actually do that. So you can say, well, I want as fast as speed possible. Then I want very few asserts, only critical points to be enabled. Or maybe I want to have you care about speed. There's only bugging at home, and something is wrong, and I need to figure it out. Then I enable everything. It's maybe slower, but it gives you, you know, more confidence of what you're seeing or more understanding of what you're seeing. So, um, any questions? But before we move on, very quickly, there are other things that PSL offers. These were, these were just a few things we had time to talk today about. But uh, there are runtime memory allocators. There is a trait support, which is very cool because basically it allows you to specify properties about your types. And in some ways, it allows other types to reason about these properties and take appropriate behavior when these are detected. For example, if I know that a certain type is bitwise copyable, that means that you can man copy it in, into another object when you want to copy it, and you don't have to have you know maybe allocations or other things like that. Well, that's great because now all my containers can optimize their code, and when they're executing their the, 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 the copy, they don't have to invoke the copy constructor; they just do man copy, which is very fast. So there are a lot of traits, they're all listed and, and they're very useful and, and they can be expanded. And I think actually this ties a little bit into artificial intelligence or isn't it? You know, you maybe have um, some some ideas in that sense. Um, um, there is the defensive programming we talked about. It's very tied to the concept of designing by contract. You need to have contracts, because otherwise you don't know what you're testing for, right? And you don't know what the preconditions are. Uh, there is also a very nifty um, test facility. There are little components that are used to test uh, uh, the containers. This is very much aimed to uh, library developers. So if you write containers that should be standard containers, or standard performing containers, well, you can look at that, otherwise you can ignore that. And there are atomic operations that are really useful, and uh, they would be available already in C++ 11, but they're not available in C++ 3. So this is something uh, very nice, also because they run on a large number of platforms. So we have Linux, AAX, uh, uh, Sun, uh, Darwin, uh, ARM, uh, maybe I'm not, uh, Windows 32 and 64, so very, very uh, large variety of platforms. But this is very important. BSL encapsulates a, a methodology, a philosophy on how software should be write or written, how software should be packaged and deployed, physically and logically, and I think that there is a lot of, uh, there, it's not the only methodology, and it's not the only good one, but I think it, it, it's very powerful and it should be, should be uh, uh, looked at. There is a lot, I, I found that in my experience that I, I learned a lot from it. Um, this is what we talked about today, and there are other things too. Uh, there are meta functions to do meta template programming for those you know that are a little bit more uh, 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 funky, and then um, there is a, uh, a way, and I'm not going to get into it, but there is a way to plug BSL as your standard library where applicable, just directly in your code without you touching the code. It's, uh, it works, we use it at Bloomberg, it's very cool, but it has some you know, uh, pros and cons, because then you, know, you force everybody else who's using your code to use it. But it's available and it's powerful and it's documented on GitHub. That's a link. You can go and read about it. And well, there's a lot more. So I really invite you guys to. This is a big thing. This is the first open source library released by Bloomberg, and and it's being the effort of a lot of people, a lot of work. I personally wrote uh, the unordered containers in the library together with another person. We spent you know a lot of time documenting it, making it good and readable for people. So please go read it and you know. <laughs> Make us feel we spend time in the library. In the future, this is what we'll have. Data calendars, time to support, concurrency library, all this is coming. 
uh, very soon. Uh, and this is what you have to do. GitConf, we, if you want to contribute and add to the library, you're very much uh, 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 welcome to do so. This is the agreement you have to sign to say, well, I'm not just going to you know, rip off Bloomberg out of it. And then just you know, start hacking away. And for any question, you can go uh, and email me at, at that address, or uh, you can visit my website. Uh, the, the presentation and the video of the talk will be on the, on the website as well, uh, sooner tonight or maybe tomorrow. And I think that's it. Including the video of the talk. Including the video of the talk. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.